So this week, we're continuing our series of the month on sparking hope. Last week, if you were here, we followed along with the trip of the three magi to learn about how they sparked hope and what we can learn from them. We learned that hope often shows up when we take curiosity seriously. We learned how to value being humble, especially to Jesus in our lives. When we remember that hope is for everyone everywhere and not just a select group of people. And that all of those things together can inspire us to give generous gifts that reflect the person of Jesus. So that was last week and about what sparked hope. So this week's passage asks the question, are there things that get in the way of sparking that hope? Are there things that provide blockers to that? Parables are great for lots of reasons. They're stories, which is good. But they often help us figure out what it is that Jesus wants us to focus on what Jesus wants us to remember about God and about our relationship to God and our relationship to each other. So we're going to hear a parable today, and the main characters in this are going to be in the scripture referred to as master and servant or master and slave. I like the phrase, the one in charge <laughs> and those who serve. <laughs> so that's the way, that's the phrasing I will be using consistently other than when I read the scripture. Uh, but this idea, the one in charge is giving out talents to take care of the, the the one in charge is leaving, and so putting these talents in good care because they're important. They come from the one in charge. So the first person, he gives five talents, and then to the other one, he gives two, and then to the last person, he gives one because, you know, it's the Bible. We love things in threes. So the owner goes away, the one in charge goes away and then returns and checks in on how the talents have gone. And the one with five doubles what they had, and the one with two also doubles what they have, and the one in charge says, you are good and trustworthy, and you're called to enter into the joy of the one in charge. So in the start of this, they spark so much hope. It has multiplied under their care, these talents. Then it gets to the last person with one talent, and that's who we're going to focus on first. So from Matthew, it says, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I picked the rough part of the passage. <laughs> I don't know about you, I am never a fan of the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth and the darkness. Or the one in charge being so frustrated in fact, when I read it, I think I want to avoid that at all costs, which means I should probably pay attention to this part because it's serious. The parable is asking the question, how we treat the talents that the person in charge gives us is serious business. I also understand why at this point, lots of people just slam the Bible shut and walk away. Or they shrug their shoulders and say, this stuff is so strange and weird. Why is this in here? It doesn't sound like the Jesus that I know. But not us. We learned last week we're going to be like magi, right? We're going to be curious, right? We're going to be okay with saying we don't know why this is in here, why this is so hard. We're going to test our own ability to be humble about it. But we do it because we want epiphanies. We're in the season of epiphany and we want some. And they start here. So curiosity asks questions, which is a fundamental thing we teach our children very early on. For the kiddos that went downstairs, they go to our worship and wonder program, which I love, love, love. And the very first thing after they've heard a story is they're asking questions, because that's what we want to teach them. When you hear the Bible, the first thing you do is you ask questions, and they ask wonder questions. So here are some of my wonder questions. I wonder why the person with the least, with supposedly the least, was treated so harshly. 
I wonder what the servant thought about what he or she had done with the talent that the one in charge had given them. I wonder why the one in charge was so frustrated. Doesn't Jesus talk about the last shall be first, that the meek shall inherit the earth? I've read the First Testament. I'm used to God celebrating the little person, whether that's David or someone else, the outsider like Rahab, the unlikely person, the outcast, supposedly the person with the least. Even like the Magi last week, they were from somewhere else. They weren't from the inside group, and yet they were essential to the beginning of the story of Jesus. And then I got curious about that next to last verse. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Now, I know the gospel is challenging. I'm used to that. I know that parables are confusing. I'm used to that. But this doesn't sound right either. That the rich will get more, the poor will get nothing. So again, it invites us to be curious about what is actually being said. So those who have, more will be given. There will be abundance. Those who have. And we'll come back to that later. But to those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Now, here's the part that got clarified for me this week when I was researching and studying this. It says, Jesus doesn't say to those who have one, to those who have a little, to those who have a few. Jesus says to those who have Nothing. All right, Tommy's right there. I was going to ask him. So, Tommy, if you hold your hands out and you have nothing in them, can I take that from you? No, you have nothing. It's impossible. So maybe Jesus, Jesus isn't commenting on what the last servant did or had, but on how the servant with one thought about what he had. Luther K. Snow wrote The Power of Asset Mapping, and he's shaping our gifts workshop that's coming in two weeks, which everyone who's a member, I'm sure, has already signed up and put it on their calendar to be here on the 28th. Yes, Jerry's saying, please do so. (laughs) So is Meredith. So uh, in his book, he says, maybe the point is not how much we have about this particular story, but about how much we think we have. This is one of those times where I'm reading it and I'm working on the sermon and I have to get up and like walk around the room because I'm like, oh, okay, I got to think about that one. Remember how we talked last week, we have to learn to kneel before Jesus to get humble. Maybe the point isn't, it's not how much we have, but how much we think we have, that he's pointing out that the last person in the parable didn't have nothing. He had one talent equal to a thousand denarii or dollars or however you wanted to say. And not only did he have one, it was a talent given to him or her by the one in charge and given to them because it was so valuable it could not be left without care and protection considered valuable. It wasn't the five, and it wasn't the two, but it wasn't nothing. But the servant, the receiver of the talent, acted as though he or she had nothing. Buried it, hid it away, treated it as useless, didn't even try to see if it would spark hope either in themselves or anyone else. Oh, it must be too small. It can't possibly shine any light into any darkness. And the part that convicted me was how often do we treat our own lives, our own situations, our families, our church, our jobs, as if we have nothing because we don't have as much or in the same way as others. Or we don't have as much as we used to, or it's different than what we usually value, or we got what we wanted and it still seemed like nothing. As I said, the Bible loves three, but I think there are three servants because they are a reminder of the dangers of comparison. Comparison is both the greedy thief of joy, 
But I would also say that it is the greedy thief of gratitude. Of seeing what you have. I can't imagine how many churches out there right now would say, boy, if we had what FCC Louisville had, if we had that band, boy, if we had this property, if we had this many people with gifts, we could only, look what we could do if we had that. And I mention it because everybody falls into this trap. This is incredibly normal. We could also be the church or the people looking at someone else in someplace else saying, if we only had what they had, we could what? It's not what we have, but what we think we have. And again, this is not the false positivity, we're just going to pretend like everything's okay. I think if we're going to be really honest about how hard it is to be church in 2024, which can I get an amen for that? Okay. (laughs) Then we also have to be really honest and brutally honest about how much abundance we do have here. I will also take an amen for that. And I think it comes from cultivating gratitude intentionally. I was very lucky I got a Lily Grant for a sabbatical, and I spent three months of my sabbatical, entire, and it was entirely shaped around the idea of gratitude. I was interested in how if a community practiced intentional gratitude and I practiced intentional gratitude, what kind of changes and effect it would have. And we've got scientific proof that gratitude is good for you. It changes the science of your brain. I'm looking at Betty Atkins because the elders talked about it. Um, So there's the scientific reason of it, but I also have seen it in real time. If you've ever been in a meeting, and I know nobody's ever been in a meeting where anybody complains, right? If you've ever been in a meeting where people are grumbling, and they're legit, these are legit complaints. This is not false complaints. These are real. If someone can bring gratitude into that meeting, it's like the air in the room changes. Aren't we lucky we have to wrestle with this? Isn't a gift that this is hard. I had an example this week. We uh, had our uh, administration meeting, and they had to hammer out a new facilities policy for the use of the church building. It was as exactly as much fun as you imagined it was. But here's the deal. Before frustration ever even entered into the room, the whole team was like, isn't it wonderful that we have so many people using our building? We need a building policy to do this? Isn't it wonderful that we found ways to serve and love our neighbors and our friends by using our space in certain ways? That we're offering a ministry of hospitality and fellowship so consistently? Made the work of it much quicker. And Drexel always appreciates a quick meeting. When I can make that shift to gratitude... As Abraham Lincoln says, I am driven to my knees to really look at what God has blessed us with before a God who has given so generously and such good gifts in my life, in my ministry. How dare I suggest that I have nothing? As many of you noticed, there are a lot of guests today Lots of those are my family and my friends. They're celebrating. It's my two-year anniversary here. Yay! How dare I look upon this crowd and suggest that I have nothing. As I said, the elders talked about the importance of a regular, intentional gratitude practice in our elders, in the church, in our spiritual life at their retreat this year. Because that gratitude keeps humility both in front of us and reminds us of the abundance that is already all around us. That the glass is not half empty. It is not nothing. It is at least half full. At least. And I think that kind of gratitude helps us do like the Magi did, which is think outside the box about the gifts that we do have. Sometimes we have to think as far as the East from where they came. And that's one of the key pieces to this gift workshop that we're offering in two weeks is to help us see the abundance that is already all around us, but also in us. And think about our gifts in new ways, things that maybe we previously saw as nothing, like the servant in the parable, become valuable 
because we realize that they are talents and gifts from the one in charge from God who loves us. That might be, like I said, about our building or our land or the community organizations we're connected to or our own individual gifts. But what happens to them when we use them to follow the light, to follow Jesus? But the other thing I think that this workshop and other things in gratitude reminds us humbly is the good news that God did not create a single creature on earth without at least one talent. Not a single creature. And most of the time it is many, many more. And here's the deal. The fact that everybody gets gifted doesn't make our gifts any less valuable. It just makes God more generous and more amazing. I'm not going to get mad over the fact that Taylor Swift and Beyonce seem to have gotten a larger amount of talent than the rest of the world. (laughs) But I can still be grateful for the ones that I have, that I get exposed to. Somebody mentioned it earlier today. We all got the same gift today. We all got up this morning. We're living in God's good creation. We are breathing the air God gave us. We get to worship a God who gives good and generous gifts, and talents, a God who is demanding, but the demands are for our own good and the good of the world, inviting us to be grateful, not afraid, inviting us to invest and share our talents to discover even more abundance, is demanding that we not overlook or underestimate or take for granted the gifts God gives to us. Because somehow when we do that overlooking and underestimating or taking for granted, it makes things like an outer darkness. It leaves us gnashing our teeth. The parable of this one talent servant reminds us that even in the smallest amounts, our talents and our gifts are still valuable. And they are valuable because they have the power to spark hope in ourselves and in others. But that wasn't the only part of the story. It wasn't the only lesson. There were those other two servants. We went past them so quickly. But they also show us what happens when we are grateful, when we appreciate the gifts that God has generally given us, when we use them wisely, when we think about them thoughtfully, when we use them on behalf of Jesus, they multiply. They don't stay the same. They become more, they become bigger. But also, they tell us that when we share our gifts, no matter the size or the amount, it brings us and others into the joy of the one in charge. That joy we keep talking is a gift that God offers to us so graciously. Showing others when we share our gifts. This is not even something we have to keep to ourselves. When we show it to others, we show them that they have a gift as well, at least one. We are not the only ones that get to walk into that joy. We get to invite everyone along with us.